Thank you, Brother Aaron. I think that's a very, uh, very wise thing he just said. He prayed that my understanding might be fruitful. So do I. I have a, a great comfort that I've always taken from these moments that we can stand before one another and proclaim the gospel. As long as you're speaking something from the scriptures and don't admix it too much with your own thoughts, it, you'll be fine. It's like standing on the wall like the old guards would do all night long. Tim and I talked about this morning. That's what we're doing. We're standing on the wall and we are proclaiming what we see, okay? If we, if we stand there and the enemy's coming and we're sleeping and slumbering, and we have not done our job, then our blood, your blood, is on our heads. But as long as we call out these things that we've seen and heard, then uh, that we're free from that blood. Once again, <clears throat> this year's renewal concerns itself with the prophecies of the Messiah. In other words, we want to talk about, think about this, this whole thing again. What messianic proclamation, revelation, or prediction was made in the old scriptures in times past and subsequently, that means afterwards, fulfilled about this Shiloh, this Messiah, this Savior of the world, this King that reigns? What ones of those were fulfilled in the man Christ Jesus? Now these are important issues right now because it directly impacts the souls, our very souls. So we want, to, uh, we want to remember what's at stake when we hear these things. Another thing, and I'm not sure where I first heard this, this was not original with me. You will hear that in, uh, many times when I pray before our congregation starts its meetings that we would hear as for eternity. What I'm, what I'm admonishing us all to do is to set our hearts and our minds to say, Lord, help me understand. It's, the man said, I believe a little. Help my unbelief. And the Lord will. Okay, to what purpose? What purpose is this prophecy? In Isaiah 48, he says, I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. There was a reason that the Lord felt that we needed to hear this explanation of what this was all about. He sets it correctly here. He says, God equates, notice here, declare and show. He declares them, he shows them, he equates them with doing them, okay? The word went forth out of his mouth in absolute power. That's the mighty word of God. He goes on to say, because I knew that thou art obstinate. And my face, I think, was red as I read this again. He, to us, if we read these books as history, as nothing more than the building blocks of religious and social civilization, we have missed the point. Everything that takes place in the scripture is directed directly at your heart. It must affect you or it is of no value. No value. So this is not, these aren't just, this isn't useless utterance, okay? Because I knew thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass, I have even from the beginning declared it unto thee. Now he's talking about prophecy, what this telling something that's going to come to pass before you see it come to pass. So you'll know that God has spoken these things. Again, he's teaching us from eternity. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee before it came to pass. I showed it to thee, lest thou should say, Well, mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. See, they're making it up. It's, being, it's foolish. Thou hast heard, see all this, and will you not declare it? I have showed thee new things from this time even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. They are created now. Again, this is out of Isaiah 48, 7 here. And not from the beginning. These are new works. These are things that the Lord is doing in the earth. And even before the day when thou heardst them not, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew them. Yea, thou heardst not. Yea, thou knowest not. Yea, from that time, that thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wouldst deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Now, here's what he says to us. For my name's sake, 
I will defer my anger, and for my praise I will refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. The purpose of God in the world was to save men. Jesus came into the world to seek and to save the lost. And he goes on to say, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how shall my name be polluted, and I will not give my glory to another? Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I am the last. In these things, as we contemplate these, and our minds are not too crowded by the issues that, that surround us every day. In these things, we have heard and entered into the realm of the eternal. We must realize this. These are not just words, as Brother, was talking, Brother Bill was talking earlier. These, these are not just simple statements. These are, these are illusions that draw our minds into the reality of the, of the things that really are. We've entered into the realm of the eternal into heaven's holy council halls, as we hear God speaking, into that innumerable company. And now we begin to understand that period of silence in heaven. And we are overwhelmed by the glory of God revealed in this place. Praise God that he's showing us his desire for the nations. Here's a various consideration now for us then regarding our gathering unto him. If Christ was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, shouldn't we be busy making certain that we're indeed in him? We don't have, this is all about what, this is what we're talking about. This is the main issue of everything that we're talking about. In him. We want to be sure that we are in him. Now, my specific assignment, as Brother Tim so eloquently stated, was from Genesis 49. I want to look at this passage, read this to you. Um, this is uh, when old Jacob was an elderly and tired man. He blesses his sons here, and in this profound moment, reveals the work and the purpose of the Lord. Starting off with verse 1, I want to just jump around just a little bit here and, and lay some groundwork. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I, might, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Now you'll notice that not every father does that to his children today. The significance of this cannot be overstated of what is taking place here. Again, God is, is referring to those things that are about to come to pass. Gather yourselves together, verse 2, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. And then he takes off. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. And so Jacob begins to speak the profound, spirit-breathed words of God's divine purpose in men and displaying God's eternal purpose for men. In the heavenly declaration spoken in the ears of heaven's angels, the Lord displays his intentions. And there was no better way to declare it than the way that he did. Employing the very race he intended to save, he clearly displays the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Jacob continues now in the area of our sign text down in verse 8 with Judah, the subject of our text. He says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Whoa. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Whoa. They're all standing around listening to this. Again, these things are not said of the others. There is no confusion or ambiguity about the point of this text. Judah is a lion's whelp. This is very interesting. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? That's kind of a strange play on words. But what he said was this old, mature lion has taken a prey. And he's resting by it leisurely. And nobody's going to rouse him from it. Now, see, he's talking about Judah here in front of his brothers. There's, there's, a, there's a, a feeling of awe that would come over you when you hear this prophetic language. Our text directly here is verse 10. The scepter 
shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. I have liked that since I first heard that. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And he goes on, binding his foal under the vine and his ass's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Seeming illustrations here to our Savior's kinship with both blood and purity. And we know how this works out too. Now let's consider some of these important allusions and scriptural definitions here based on what he laid before us. The sepulcher shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. His scepter depicts the royal staff. I've always, I like this. It's also referred to as the, uh, the sword of state. And ancient rulers are often pictured holding the symbol of power and authority. And here we find Judah's Shiloh image prominently endowed with the honor directly from the prophetic throne of the Lord God himself. Uh, a few references to this, this idea of the scepter. You remember from Esther there? I think that's the most pointed one, the all of scripture. This is a wonderful text here, Esther 4. It says, And the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever whether man or woman, shall come into the king from the inner court, who is not called into the inner court, there is one law to put him to death, except such whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that they may live. Absolute authority, understood and honored by all. Again, no ambiguity about what he was talking about in that time. Uh, on in, uh, down in Esther 5, 2, when she made that uh, journey, and it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand, and Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. What graciousness have we seen from the throne of God? Now, as we, and I'm not going to talk about this, but as you, we roll these illusions forward until we see Jesus taking the little children up in their arms, as Brother Bill mentioned, touching them, taking them by the hand and leading them out of the city. What kind of man is this that answers to old Jacob's prophecy? We also have this wonderful package, passage in uh, Numbers 24. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall, he, uh, shall come he that shall have dominion, and so on. Again, a sign of absolute power and absolute authority. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Remember, we have references here also that are significant in the idea of the lawgiver throughout Scripture. Of course, we recognize that the Lord God, as the lawgiver, made, made the mountain to smoke as Moses received the holy communion, uh, commandments there at Sinai. In the giving of the Decalogue, it says that, uh, And he gave unto us when he had made an end of communing with him upon the Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. There's an there's a idea, the concept of the, law, of the lawgiver. And Nehemiah the prophet recalls, Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai and speakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. So the lawgiver. But there's another aspect to this lawgiver having to do with the mercy that rejoices. In James, he says... Um, so speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged of the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, who hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Remember now, we're going to this, this idea that unto him, this one, shall the gathering of the people be. That's our core text that we're going to work over. David wonderful, wonderfully re-echoes the details given to Jacob two different times with great precision. He said, Gilead is mine in Psalm 60, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Ah, interesting. And he does it again in Psalms 1-8, exactly the same verbiage. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Where did he get that? From Jacob. 
the prophecy of the Messiah. Isaiah identified the lawgiver as being the Lord. He said, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Amen. Amen. James indicates the lawgiver was still in control. In James 4, he says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? This great one, the lawgiver, is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, what about this interesting allusion? And I'm jumping through these because I want you to see these because they intrigue me so. Now, what about the allusions to this Shiloh? Again, that's something that intrigued me as being kind of an ethereal thing. As a location, it was a place in the land of Canaan where the Ark of the Covenant, which is God's visible presence, rested. And the Lord spoke with them from this location. So in uh, Samuel, the Lord said, appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord himself revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Also, the people equated the resting place of the ark, the place of the Lord's presence again, with God's protection and powerful security from their enemies. Uh, in 1 Samuel 4, 3 there it says, And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us this day before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark out of the covenant, Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, and when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. So they, this place, this resting place of the ark was, was known as Shiloh. To fleshly Israel, the Lord was present at or in or near Shiloh as a location. In Christ, this wondrous presence is within you. He is lifted up. We have been gathered or drawn to him. The eternal spirit lives within us. Matthew Henry said of this passage, he says, Judah's name signifies praise. God was praised for him, praised by him, and praised in him. Therefore, his brethren shall praise him. Judah should be a strong and courageous tribe. Judah is compared to a, a lion, not a lion raging and ranging all around, but to a lion enjoying the satisfaction of his power and success. Judah shall be the royal tribe, the tribe from which Messiah the Prince should come, Shiloh, that promised seed in whom the earth should be blessed, that peaceable and prosperous one, our Savior, he shall come of Judah. Thus, dying Jacob, at a great distance, this amazes me, at a great distance saw Christ's day and it was his comfort and his support on his deathbed. Matthew Henry soberly concludes this. He says, those who will not be subject to the commands of God make themselves subject to the curse of God. And all those outside of this gracious image this prophesied one, this Shiloh who was for to come, are in a precarious and deadly situation. Specifically now of this gathering, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. When the Lord desired to address the people, he would command them to be gathered. This was not uncommon. Brother Leon spent a lot of time with us on that. He would gather them together and address or bless them as a group. An example would be when Moses pleaded with the children of Israel, and he reminded them of a gathering that they all remembered, by the way. He says, you remember specifically the day that thou stoodst before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And this concept of a gathering brought exciting prospects as revealed all through the prophets. Isaiah said, The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, yet will I gather others to them. Now, who, who do you think they might be talking about? Sounds good, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Besides them that are gathered under him. I consider the Gentiles as being part of that group. Jeremiah also said, And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations, and from the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place where I have caused you to be carried away captive. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jeremiah also said, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles of far off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. 
The prophet Ezekiel, now I'm just listening, this, this is like a big rock in the water and all of these rings. These are all the prophets and they're all saying the same thing. Ezekiel said, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel, that land of promise. And I'm reminded of Brother, Brother Leon's message, as I said, on all of these, these thoughts about gatherings. One last one out of Ezekiel. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will make the children of Israel from among the heathen. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. That sounds something like a place prepared, doesn't it? These illusions are not incidental and they're not accidental. To us, these gatherings have also become very important and very significant. And the reason that we're gathered here today is to hear these promises, to help us focus our lives' direction heavenward. In Micah it says, but in the last days, and this has been read before, let me read this to you again. Micah says, in the last days shall it come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come, shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you notice who they chose? In this the prophet wants to point you back to Jacob. Why? Because Jacob is the one that read this prophecy to Judah regarding these things. Again, this, the tenor of Scripture is all flowing Christward. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, and the law shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. On down to verse 6, it says, In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, <laughs> or is bruised, Brother Bill, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. That sounds so good you would think that unto him the people would be gathered. Amen. The prophet Isaiah said in 11:12, and he shall set up an ensign. An ensign would be a flag or a standard or a gathering place. That was the point of those. For the nations and shall assemble all the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah, who we're talking about here again, from the four corners of the earth. Is this a dispersed crowd here? Yes. Sounds pretty good to me. But how could this gathering ever be, okay? After all, the issues that surround us are greater than us. Sin and death seems to have absolute reign in this shaky old world. The answer is Shiloh. Yes, Shiloh has truly come. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus would say to Philip, have I been so long with you? And yet thou hast not known me, Philip, or Dan, or Bob, or Amy, or Mike. It makes no difference here. We all fit. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The Lord God Almighty has drawn us, has gathered us unto himself through his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jacob said to Judah. Jacob prophesied of Christ, the Christ of God. Jesus was the one that was lifted up in earth's wilderness. Jesus was that brazen serpent that soothed the fiery poison of Satan in us. Jesus has been lifted up and has drawn all men unto himself. Notice how graciously that vile image of the serpent in the garden was undone and redeemed by the cooling brazen serpent on that staff. The fatal, vicious, and fiery bite of Satan's worst offense was completely, completely overshadowed by our gathering unto him. As Brother Ricky mentioned last evening, our Lord reigns unchallenged in the domains of life and death in this world and the world to come. When he was lifted up, the work of the cross, the gift of eternal life, was given to mankind. Even today, where he is lifted up, 
Men are raised to walk in newness of life. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Again, the specific items Jacob included in this blessing to Judah were not given to any of the other tribes. The scepter, the kingly power and authority to rule and to reign forever. The lawgiver, he was the one to establish the foundations of righteousness. He was the one that fulfilled the law. It was he who bare our sins in his own body on the tree, who loved us, who washed us from our sins in his own blood. Je uh, Jacob, Jacob, old Jacob again, clearly proclaimed, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies, and thy father's children shall bow down before thee. He was special here. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, thou art gone up.